Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the talk. I am really glad to be here today to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing on um, feedback-based buzzing and how we combine this with ZAP in order to have really effective testing of, of web applications. I am Khaled. I am one of the co-founders and the CTO of Code Intelligence, and we are a startup from Bonn in Germany that that are we are mainly working on um, on fuzzing and our product CI Fuzz in order to enable developers to in easily or seamlessly integrate fuzzing into their development process and benefit uh, from this very effective technology. And so, since we're talking about fuzzing, let's give a, a brief introduction about what what's what is fuzzing, what uh, what fuzzing actually is. So, the core idea of fuzzing that that has been that has that was started like almost more than 30 years ago was if I have an, an application or a system under test, let's let us throw some some random data into the application and see if it crashes. And this is this is the, the core idea of us. And while this um, approach um, was able to find bugs uh, or many bugs in, in applications, it has a very obvious limitation. So since we're th throwing random inputs at the application, it's highly unlikely that we will we'll be able to cover a lot of code, meaning it's hard to trigger deep program states because we don't have any insights about what's happening inside the program. And because in most cases, these random inputs that are generated by the fuzzer would be rejected quite early by the application. And so, in order to mitigate this problem, um, came the idea of okay, instead of generating these random inputs, let's start from the test data that are available anyway with the application. So, if we take an example as a, an image parser, uh, usually we would have some some images there to for to do some some unit testing to make sure that the parser, the parsing, or the the logic is um, is correct. And there, the idea would be: let's take this as a as seeds or a starting inputs, and try to do some mutations based on, on that. So, trying maybe to change the colors, to keep some bits and bytes, and see what what's happening. And with this, we hope to reach more code coverage. But again, here we have the same limitation: is that with the fuzzer or the the testing uh, framework does not have any insights or informations about uh, what's actually happening inside the program. And the real breakthrough of um, for fuzzing um, came with, with, the, with AFL. And there it was the core idea was um, let's integrate some feedback information into the fuzzer. And with this, the idea would be let's instrument the application uh, or the, the code that I want to test. With these, uh, we mean injecting some special markers into the application, into the code of the application. And these markers would then give the fuzzer feedback about which code areas have been um, covered, which paths of the program have been executed, and information about different program states so that the fuzzer would have enough information or good information about what's happening inside the application with the input that generates. So if we uh, stick with the uh, with the image parser as an example, let's see how coverage guided fuzzing would have needs. So the fuzzer does not have to have any previous information about, about the application. So it basically starts with some with some random bytes and here with a with a null byte. And then it executes its application. And with instrumentation, it gets feedback. OK, these are the code areas, or the, the lines of code, for example, that have been touched. And we can see this is OK. Um, this, this is an, an um, invalid image, so it, it returns an unknown format. But the fuzzer sees all the comparisons that, that, that are happening in the code. And it sees, for example, that the, the the inputs that it generated it gets compared to some some constants 
So, okay, take this as a hint and try in the next iteration to use them. And obviously this is an, an invalid image, but with this information, with this coverage information, with this information that these comparisons have taken place, the fuzzer can then try out some of them. See, okay, here I will use one of these constants that I've seen in the program as, as an input and see what's happening. So if it tries this input, now we've seen that this input takes a different code back. And now the fuzzer successfully convinced the application to, to, to interpret the, um, the input as a, as a GBAC image, for example. And this means that this is a valid image. And um, the fuzzer does this quite fast and it, it performs several thousands of executions in, in, uh, per second. And so now we have. Uh, valid images, and um, with each mutation, the fuzzer gains more insights into the application, and the fuzzer does not get bored. It means that it, it really it can execute, overform, generates thousands of test cases per second, and with the time, the fuzzer would then generate sort of it evolves the test cases that it generates in order to achieve. Mm, high code coverage. And this is actually uh, an actual experiment that was done with an image parser. And the fuzzer, after a few hours, was able to generate valid images from the image parsing uh, application, even if it did that, even that it didn't know that it's trying to fuzz an image parser. And this shows the effectiveness of, of coverage by this parser. And so this is another way just to give it a, a more high level illustration. So with black box fuzzing, you don't have any insight about what code areas or code paths have uh, each input has triggered. And with the, with the gray box fuzzing and with instrumentation based fuzzing, the fuzzer would know the path it took inside the application. And this would help it to generate high quality test cases that uh, are more likely to trigger bugs. Let's have a look at the industry and the adoption of fuzzing. Tech leaders like Google and Microsoft find most of their bugs with fuzzing. And as an example, fuzzing alone has found over 29,000 bugs in Google Pro. And this shows how effective this method actually is. But usually when we talk about fuzzing, we usually mean C and C++ applications. And there we have really mature um, tooling and setup. Um, but in the context of web applications um, that are mainly written in Java or JVM based languages, the tooling um, is not as mature. And this is what we um, aim to, um, to change. And for that, we developed Jazzer. Jazzer is a coverage guided in process fuzzer for the JVM. And it's based on, on LibFuzzer. So, LibFuzzer is a very powerful fuzzing engine developed by Google, mainly for C and C. And we based Jazzer on, on LibFuzzer so that we can benefit from all the powerful features that are already available there. And it has many smart mutations uh, that increases or maximizes the code coverage reached during fuzzing. And it has the ability to add some custom mutators, meaning that if you have, an, if you have an, an application or a software that you want to test that receives data of, or inputs of a, of a certain structure, you can add mutators, special mutators for, the, for that into, into Jezzer. And Jezzer is completely open source, so it's available in GitHub and can have a look. And it's by orders of magnitude better or more effective than available Java fuzzer and um, it, it will be soon uh, it will be soon integrated into a um, a fuzzing a public fuzz, fuzzing platform in order to um, fuzz open source software uh, written in Java. 
Okay, and now I would like to show a small demo of a real vulnerability that we found in the real world um, software. And this is a um, cross-site scripting vulnerability that we found in the um, OWASB JSON sanitizer. So the JSON sanitizer is a library that giving a JSON-like input, you would get a valid JSON. And there, the goal is to make it easier and safer to take um, the sanitizer output and put it or embed it into a HTML or XML document. And now I'd like to show how we found this vulnerability, how this looks uh, like an edge. So here, I have the jar file of the JSON sanitizer. Mm -hmm. And all I have to do is to write a small test harness or fast target. And all what this fast target does is actually it implements one uh, fuzzer test one input method that takes data from the from the fuzzer and forward it to my to the API that I want to test. And in this case, we add a check that checks if the sanitized output contains a closing script tag. And this would mean that cross-site scripting would be would be possible. So now all I have to do is to Compile my my first target, and then uh, start Jezer. So all that Jezer needs is the, the class path of the my library and the my um, my uh, where I put my first target and which class it needs to to fuzz where we define the fuzzer test when input method, and that's it. So now Jezer would automatically instrument the code uh, using a Java agent and it would try to generate inputs that maximize the code coverage. And you see here that here we have good information about code coverage and here we see that how many executions per second Zeb is, is performing and so it's on my my laptop with a single core and we, we achieve more than uh, 53 1,000 executions per second, and fair enough, um, Zap was able to generate an, an, an input that whose sanitized output contained this closing script. And of course, Zap would then output a, um, a, a, crashing, um, a crashing output, and you would get a, a reproducer automatically generated, meaning that you can take this Java file, compile it, and then you can reproduce the bug. And here, it took us just a few seconds in order to be able to trigger this vulnerability. And this shows the effectiveness of, of coverage guided fuzzing and how can, can it be really beneficial in order to identify real vulnerabilities. And so on the Jazzer uh, GitHub page, you would find the, the list of vulnerabilities that are that we published, and some of them we have some vulnerabilities that are not yet disclosed because we're doing responsible disclosure. So we're working with the developers so that they can fix, and then we would then publish them on on, on the on the Jazzer GitHub page. So here in this talk and the context of this conference, we're mainly interested in testing web applications and performing fuzzing or coverage guided fuzzing for web applications comes with very special challenges. First, we have highly structured inputs. Think like about a web application that expects, for example, a REST API. There we have the in, each endpoint accepts requests of a very specific structure. And just throwing random data into these endpoints would just would be very highly uh, ineffective because uh, these inputs would be rejected quite early in the processing. And here we're talking mainly about uh, applications or software written in Java or JVM uh, based language. And we have a different class of bugs uh, we're interested in compared to C and C++ because Java is a memory, it's a memory safe language. And here we're more interested in finding bugs like um, SQL injections and cross site scripting, et cetera. And Zep is a great tool for that. So Zep has really great scanners for detecting um, 
a wide range of, of bugs, so many bug classes. It has both active and active scanners, and with the active scanners, you actually attack the application. But since that does not instrument the code, it lacks insights about which code areas have been tested or insights about what's exactly what's happening inside the application, which might, which would lead into some false positives in the, um, in the report results. On the other hand, we have Jezzer. And since we perform instrumentation, we get deep insight into the test code. So we know exactly which code areas have been, have been reached. And we know based on that, we have some smart, smart heuristics to maximize the code coverage. And what that does is that it's for each interesting test cases that it generates, it keeps, keeps it in a, in what we call a corpus. And this corpus enables Zep or enables Jezzer to start from the, uh, the, la the state of the last run, meaning that when we start fuzzing again, we don't have to start exploring the program from the start. With using the corpus, Zep would start, uh, Jezzer would start from the um, state of the last run. And we you reuse some of the bug detectors from Zep, and we have also some on for Jezzer, um, uh, our own instrumentation-based bug detectors. But if we if if we look at these two approaches, I mean they are perfectly fit to to be to work with each other. So we can use Jezzer to maximize code coverage, and we can use the, the really powerful active scanners from Zep to attack or to test the application. So in order to in to have really effective results, we combined Zep and, and Jezzer and now we'll um, I will discuss exactly how we do it. So here we see how Jezzer and Zep would test a uh, web application. So with Jezzer it generates the the fuzzer generated request sent to the application, it receives a, um, a, a feedback and uses this to maximize code. And Zep would then use its um, active scanner to attack the application on the test. And now I will discuss how we make this link so that Zep and Jezzer can collaborate into testing the application. So we talked about custom mutators and that it wouldn't make sense to just throw some random data uh, onto the application under testing so for dealing with a web application. And for Jezzer, we implemented on top of it using its custom uh, mutator interface, what you call a web mutator. And this web mutator would just take a, an API definition uh, describing um, the endpoints the endpoints of the application. So what what are in, what are the endpoints that are available there and how the inbox or the requests that are expected by each endpoint should be restructured. And the web mutator would just provide valid or mutations. So it, it, it guarantees that at all time, it generates valid requests according to the, to the, to the definition. And so with that, we guarantee that all requests that we send using Jezzer is accepted or are accepted by the application. And then we get valuable feedback. With it. And so we do it in a way that when Jezzer generates an input, or a request that results in a new code coverage. So Jezza would generate a request, we get a feedback, and when Jezza sees that this request actually results in a new code, new code coverage, this interesting request would then be forwarded to Zep so that the active scanner of Zep can use this request as a seed for the active scanner. So Zep would then attack this input, guaranteeing that this input or this request has interesting code coverage or new code coverage that the other request um, does not. And also, just to complete the, the feedback, the inputs of the request that are generated by Zep also are also forwarded to Jezzer so that they can, can try them out and see if any of them can actually also lead to new code coverage. And here we see this, this loop where using instrumentation using the feedback or the insights that Jezzer has about the code. It uses this 
insight to gather interesting inputs and send them to Zap so that it can attack. And inputs generated by Zap are also fed to Jezzer in order to test if they um, they reach new, um, new code uh, new code coverage. And this method we use it, this method to test um, several web applications, and this proves to be really really effective. And just an example about um, how this collaboration would, would work. Um, we see here in a code snippet, and this code snippet is from um, web code, which is a vulnerable uh, Spring Boot application. Uh, and it's there, I mean, it's intentionally vulnerable and used to just test um, uh, or to demonstrate some, some bugs. And here we see that um, this, this method expects a username and a password. And at some point it just mm, call or it just execute an SQL statement. And so this is obviously vulnerable because on the way they have there is no check uh, or there's no sanitization of these inputs. But interestingly, we see that the username is compared to, to Larry. So any username that's not Larry would just return directly and we, don't, we will not have the chance to exclude the SQL statement. And this here's where instrumentation plays a, plays a really important role. And so one of the, the methods that we, uh, that we report to Jezzer using instrumentation is all string comparisons. So whenever we have an, an equals, for example, call, um, this would be reported to Jezzer that these input, these two inputs, these two strings were compared to each other. So in this example, if, if Jezzer would just generate a username foo and it, it gets a report that foo is compared to Larry, then the next thing that Jezza would try to do is just use Larry as a username and see what happens. And what would happen in this in, in this scenario is that Jezza would just crack, would just guess, or just generate a correct username that would just um, um, satisfy this, this condition, and then we will able to uh, to um, execute in the SQL statement and able to trigger the SQL injection. And this here is the an, an example of the um, of a request that was generated by uh, by Jezzer. Username is, uh, is Larry, and we have to stop and best for And this actually triggers the um, the SQL injection. So the a black box fuzzer with no insights about the code would very highly unlikely guess um, that it, it needs to use Larry as a username, but it was very easy for Jezza to do that because it gets um, this insight or this hint from from the instrumentation that uh, from the code instrumentation that it performs. And here is another example that shows the effectiveness of instrumentation or or feedback based. So here we have um, an example that um, in Encode the input using base 64, perform some, some kind of insecure encryptions with some hard, like some commutations um, for that. And we see that this block is, is really hard to find if you, if you don't have any feedback or you don't have any information about what's actually happening inside the code. So by just, it, it's hard, very hard to to guess by by random the correct input, and um, with Jezzer and with Jezzer, it's um, this can be found very quickly. And by the way, this example is also available in the into the um, into into the into Jezzer examples available on GitHub. And here you see that the correct value is is here is called uh, Jezzer value profiling, which is the name of the technique that Jezza uses to, to crack this kind of, of, of hard checks. So uh, I, would, uh, I would encourage you to go to have a look at, um, at the examples provided by on the, on the GitHub and uh, play around with Jezza. 
So to conclude my talk, I hope I was able to convince you that feedback based fuzzing is, is really great and really effective in, in profiling bugs. And with Jezzer, we work hard to bring this power of feedback based fuzzing into the, the Java virtual machine or into the JVM based languages. And we've seen, uh, based on, on our work with, um, with the for fuzzing web applications, it's structure aware fuzzing, making the fuzzers aware of the, the structure of the inputs that are expected by the application. And that's, it's really effective for testing web application. And that combining Zep and Jezzer results in, in, a, in a better result, better results or more effective testing than when, use, when using each tool better. And this brings me to the point that I think we, we as a community should um, also uh, keep, into, keep in mind that we have, we develop really great tools and here in this case, really great dynamic analysis tools that are, um, that can very well work collaboratively with each other. And there we should think about um, how to have a sort of a, send the right interfaces so that these tools can can easily work with each other and then benefit from the more um, of um, of each other what are the next steps from our side uh we will be releasing some of the um our bug detectors so our instrumentation based bug detectors and we hope that this would enable the community to contribute to that so that we have really uh, powerful bug detectors for um, for for JVM based devs in general and for uh, web application in particular. So stay tuned, stay tuned for that. And we are organizing um, on the twenty fourth of March, uh, FASCON, the Web Security Edition. And here we have um, um, really great speakers from uh, from Google. From uh, Microsoft and uh, and Zion will also give a talk there. So we really have good talks, and they, you are more than welcome to um, to join and to uh, to participate in the conference. It's uh, the conference is completely um, free, and it's, it's an online conference. So I uh, I would invite everybody here to uh, participate. And so this brings me to the, the end of my talk. So thank you for, for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, we can talk on Discord. Or um, if you have any questions for me, uh, I'm also available on, on Twitter. And uh, just uh, look for, um, for me on Google. You will find also my, my email address. So yeah, thank you for, for your time. Awesome, Holly. Thank you so much for this presentation here. Um, I want to clarify some stuff. There's uh, people asking how this actually works with Jazzer. I think mm -hmm. what you were talking about there was all that Jazzer traffic was actually being proxied through Zap. Exactly. Uh, can you can you explain that setup a little bit more for people? I uh, I'm not sure if I missed the the video edit part of that that would actually has some Zap screenshots. I feel like they were there, but Help explain some of that just a little bit on how you had that set up and what was working there. Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, the idea is that, uh, so Zep, if you give Zep a, a, a request, it can then mutate this request and attack the corresponding endpoints. And so what's, what's since Zep does not perform uh, instrumental code, it's, it's not the intention of Zep, it's, um, it does not, get feedback on like this this request has some new interesting rich has some new interesting code and this is some of the thing where where instrumentation based fuzzing is really effective at so from from desert or from the from the fuzzer you would just sort of also attack the application to communicate with the application and each time you see a request that reaches new code this you can basically use the act the, or you can use the Jezzer API, the Zap API to say, okay, please then attack the, this request. So then from the fuzzing uh, run or from, from fuzzing engine Zap would only get 
valid or like interesting request to attack because this way we guarantee that each um each request that Zeb attacks um or that he gets from the fuzzer actually reaches new inputs so this way you can have uh, so she, with this we try to make Zeb also um like more effective mm. by integrating this knowledge that we have that's missing from Zeb because it's such an intention of Zeb but Zeb is really great at finding bugs and taking the application so so the, the the whole idea is to try to make this these two tools collaboratively work with each other yeah i think i get what you mean you, you're trying to get jazzer because jazzer knows about the source code that the application's written or the byte code so it knows a lot more about the application than zap natively would pipe that information through zap to build out the site tree and interesting places for zap to test those kinds of things um, just to make zap more aware of the application that you're trying to test and let it see things that that the fuzzer is actually trying to test as well as be able to run its own tests against those interesting endpoints is that right is exactly exactly this so um um zep can as i said like really effectively attack the application um it would be a waste of resources just to um do this black box from our point of view um, but just only use this effective method to test um requests that are that actually reach different code paths because sure. this way if you attack three requests that, or ten requests that had the exact same code coverage basically you would get the same results so you did the same the word the same work ten times and with this we just uh, focus zap um resources or zap abilities on attacking interesting interesting parts awesome of yeah uh, first of all i forgot to thank you and uh have everybody in discord they did thank you for the great talk uh i think this is this is such a maybe a tricky topic to cover really well in kind of a short 20 minute talk this this could probably be a really good like here's how to set it up kind of workshop here's how to set it up yep. here's what we're going to go but, through all those good mm -hmm. things yeah uh, it's actually i just forget to mention that we're um uh will um write a blog in the sorry a blog at a blog post in the uh, zap blog so describing this in more technical details so what what you've done there and so this we hope and also in the uh, on the on our github there is a the github of the of, of jazzer uh like a more technical and detailed information about uh, how it works internally and uh, how can you perform your own custom mutators because um, if you have a special application that expects data of certain formats, you can, we have an API where you can just implement your own mutation so that Jazzer knows how to, to mutate the inbots that, that would be uh, good for, for your specific, specific needs. Awesome. Uh, Zapper asked a good question. Does it have to run on a jar file or can you run it on a built Docker image of the underlying Java code? Can you repeat the question? I'm not sure if I understood do, correctly. Do, does Jazzer and crew have to run on a jar file? Like, do they have to attach to a jar file or, do they, or can they run on a built Docker image of the underlying Java code? And I assume you could build a Docker image with Java bytecode and Jazzer in it. Can you, can it work outside the Docker container? So what's, how Jazzer works is that you can also test it like, um, we, we instrument the code with the Java agent, meaning that um, we only need the, the byte code, so that uh, we don't need the source code to that, so that we instrument the, the, the Java byte code directly, so that you can, you're not limited then to Java, you can instrument or fuzz any JVM based languages, like for example, Kotlin. And so all that we need is the jar file, but you can run Jazzer inside the Docker container, it shouldn't be a problem. Gotcha. Hopefully that answers that question, Zapper. Um, I did have a really uh, a good question about um, the corpus 
uh, we kind of alluded to it a little bit in the talk and then in Discord as well. And this is a thing that I think a ton of people have a question about. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, how do you do incremental scans of an application as it's being developed? You think Corpus can help with that so that you get like a baseline scan of an application and then the next time it comes through CICD and you've only got small amounts of code changes, now is it only testing those small amounts of code changes? How do, have you played with that or does that work? Or what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is exactly why, why the seed corpus or why the corpus is there. So you can think of a corpus uh, as um, like in, in the, it's a directory, um, uh, a place where jazz, where fuzzing, like this is a, not specific to Jazza, but any coverage guided fuzzer. So you have a corpus. So when the fuzzer generates an, an input that results in a new code coverage, so an input that reaches new code, it saves this input in in what we, what, what's called a, a corpus. Mm -hmm. So with time, it builds in this corpus a set of interesting test cases that maximize the code coverage. And it has some also smart heuristics how this corpus can be minimized so that you can still reach the same code coverage. What, what this means is that when you start your next run, the fuzzer would not start from zero, but it would start from the previous state that it learned about the application. So it first tries to execute the application with the seed corpus, and then after that continues to try to find inputs that reach new code. And with this approach, you can also make sure that in this corpus, you can also uh, store all the crashes that the fuzzer found so that you can find regressions quite easy because all these cases that resulted in errors in the past are now in, in, the, in the corpus. And if you if a regression, that it should be re-triggered very, very, very quickly by the fuzzer. That's so the corpus is just a, a way to represent the fuzzer's knowledge about the application. And this would be uh, just um, if, if you have any like, new code changes, then the fuzzer will just find mutations that, that reach these, these, um, uh, these code areas. Awesome. Uh, there was one more uh, question, and then I think we'll have to close down Q&A for our, this particular session. Uh, but can we limit the fuzzed request generation from Jazzer? Can you limit how many requests Jazzer builds? In which sense? So you want to overload the application, or you just want to um, limit, uh, like make it slower, or... Um, yeah, I think I think what I think what the question is, and maybe he'll elaborate, Tosh, in Discord here is, can you limit how many requests it makes? And and King Thorne made a good point. There's got to be some limits, otherwise it would just run for trying to test all the particular mutations of a thing. Um, but is is it possible to limit how many iterations of a fuzzing request that Jazzer makes? Yeah, there's actually it's a simple um, command line option where you can specify can specify the number of runs. But ideally, you would just um, run. Well, first, when you first test your application, you would ideally you would just let it run longer, so for a few hours, so that it can gather this build its corpus. But then afterwards, it would be enough to run it for like um, for a few minutes. Hmm. And the good thing with fuzzing is that if you see there, uh, so you'd get also information about the code coverage, so you can see if the the code coverage is, is still increasing over time or if it's got saturated at some point. Gotcha. So it's clear to see if the fuzzer is finding you or you know, not. Awesome. Um, I think that's kind of all the time we have for QA. Obviously, this is a really rich and depth subject to, to pile together uh, fuzzing and zap. Uh, once again, uh, Khaled has said he's going to write a blog post on the on zaproxy.org that really describes the technical features of that. And hopefully once you've got that post up, uh, you'll post a link back into this Discord channel to let everybody know, hey, the, the technical stuff is up so that people can really do a deep dive into that. Uh, Here was, exactly. was the, the goal just to give an overview. And uh, I will be there in, in Discord, also on Twitter or an email. Uh, just be happy to ask to, to answer any, any questions. Yeah, awesome. If, you, if you've got like <clears throat> deep, detailed questions you want to ask, Holland. Obviously, the Discord channel is open and will be there. Uh, he's reachable in many, many other fashions as well. Um, 
but please reach out to him if you if you're super interested in this and, and you want to get deep into how that actually works and can it benefit you and your application security program or how you develop applications and you know stuff Holly, thank you so much um, for joining us today and putting time into your presentation. It was really good, such a rich, deep subject. Um, but thank you again for joining us at the very first ZAPCON. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for the wonderful organizations and the, uh, the great community also on, on this course. So it was, it was a pleasure. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna, uh, Holly, I'm gonna move you off to a different room and then I'm gonna invite back sponsors of ZapCon, the CEO of Stackhawk, Johnny Clippert, and founder of Zap Simon Bennett's. And we're going to do closing ceremonies here real quick. Thank you again. Uh, and we'll hope to talk to you soon. Thank you.